On the menu today, is it possible to play two computers simultaneously with the same joystick? Welcome. Hello Chip Dippers, welcome to another Retro Recipes bowl of nostalgia flakes. Now, as you may know, I'm a huge fan of iconic 80s magazines and pop culture icons, Zap64 and Crash, even going as far as to create my own version with a friend back in the 80s called Splash and Crack. You'll have seen that in my Zap64 documentary if you watch that. Which makes what I'm about to say even more incredible because I've actually been invited to review the C64 Maxi for the official Zap64 2021 annual. Now the 2020 annual is available now and 2021's Kickstarter is launching soon. And even better, it's brought to you again by Chris Wilkins and many of the original Zap team, like editor Roger Keane, artist Oliver Frey, and reviewers like Jazz Rignall and Perry Fractic. Oh, Yeah, I don't really have a better way to put it than that. Mind blown. Now, I've also been invited to review one or two games for the Mag, as well as comparing the C64 with the C64, well, if you know what I mean. But how would I compare them? Well, this is Retro Recipes, Retro with a Twist. So then so I then thought, I what if we could play both computers simultaneously with the same joystick? That way we could compare how faithful the emulation is by looking at how well the C64 Maxi gameplay keeps up with the real C64 based on our joystick controls, and compare the visual latency or the delay before the Maxi responds compared to the real C64. Because the emulators are renowned for their latency, making them feel slightly less responsive than the real thing. And the Maxi is essentially running the Vice Commodore 64 emulator in a fancy box. Now the 9-bit guy did a great comparison using audio where he wrote a small program that would beep after pressing a key. In order to be consistent, I'll use the same test I used before and the same television as well. Now, I'll be honest, I can at least hear a huge difference already. And the Maxi was indeed much better than the previous mini version they had released. So this test you're seeing illustrates the audio delay because when the sound effects are delayed, it can really throw you off playing a game. However, simultaneously playing both machines with the same joystick could be a really interesting way to compare not just audio, but all of the actual gameplay happening on the two screens, even if it is just a bit of fun and admittedly a bit of a zany idea. Perfect for Zap64 and Retro Recipes then. So how can we make this work? We take our regular 80s 9-pin joystick and a real Commodore 64 and plug it in in the usual way. Nothing strange there, of course the C64 uses the Atari 9-pin joystick port. But then we introduce the C64 Maxi, how do we connect it as well? Well the obvious thing is try and splice a second cable in at this point. But there is a problem, the Maxi uses USB, not 9-pin, so we'll also need to add some kind of an adapter. Hi, it's Jan Bieter. Just kidding. I do have these extension cables that would allow us to splice in two of these together to create a kind of Y cable, but obviously they don't have a USB on the other end. So through the magic of this wonderful retro community, we've got these adapters. This one is made by Retronic and was sent to me complimentary just for this project. And it's really, in theory, simple as that. Suddenly, our nine pin Atari style joystick becomes USB. So that's going to go into the C64, and then this is going to go into the C64. So the C64, <laughs> we'll just call the big one the Maxi. So then we want to create a Y cable. I don't know why. We want to think about splicing in about this point, because then on the end of it, this is going to plug into our QuickShot 2 Turbo, the old school joystick and one of my favorites. And to understand how to splice our cable correctly, we probably should understand how the joysticks actually work. And it's really super simple. The first thing to keep in mind is that the joystick is grounded. And as you know, all electricity wants to flow towards ground. This will be important in a moment. And that ground wire connects to five separate micro switches within the joystick for up, down, left, right, and fire. 
we'll just use fire for this example. But in the joystick cable, there are also five wires, each carrying five volts from the computer to the other side of each micro switch. So when you hit fire, the switch closes, completes the circuit, and pulls the five volts from that wire to ground. The computer detects the five volts disappear to ground on that fire button wire, and therefore the computer knows the fire has been pressed. So with that said, I think all I have to do is cut these cables and I can literally get rid of one of these. Put that on Fleabay. And then this is our splicing here. And the nice thing, because we're using the same cable brand, I should be able to just match the colors and everything will work automatically. I'm gonna be using this as well. I really recommend this. You'll see how this wire stripper works in a second. I'm not being rude, it says it right there and you can find the link in the description to get all the tools that I use. Let's get stripping. I do have two others. This one I found on Amazon. It was recommended by Jan Bita. Probably more useful for a arcade machine build. Of course, I've done one of those recently. Of course, you could build your own one of these. And if you wanted to do that, I recommend PCB Way. They do fantastic quality PCBs, starting from just $5. It's about £3.50. Because as we all know, PCB stands for Perifractix Controller Boards. Doesn't it? One thing I did want to do is note which parts of this we don't need. We don't need number five. We don't need fire number two. So that means we need to get our multimeter and then I can just test the continuity between each pin here and each cable there to find out the ones we don't need. So number five is now as you know I am red green colorblind. <laughs> to me that looks green. So if I'm just going to call it green. You probably may tell me it's not. Just get rid of him altogether. Okay next one we don't need is fire number two. That is yellow. Put that in our graveyard. So to make this a little easier, I'm gonna strip those wires down. I just have to make sure the rest of them follow some kind of color matching that I can recognize. Pale gray green, and this guy, a slightly darker green to my eye, is that guy. Okay, so everything matches as far as I can see, as far as the eye can see. Okay, so if I connect everything up, so I have the main cable coming from the joystick. I'm gonna splice it in to these two here. Let's get splicing. And as you can tell, these cables are super thin, just a few strands of copper in each wire, which is one of the reasons I didn't use a terminal block. Uh, there's a good chance that when you tighten those screws, it could rip the wires out. Also, I didn't have any in stock and deliveries are taking a bit of a while at the moment, as you may have noticed.
most beautiful thing I've ever... Well, okay, it's not perfect. But this whole idea is just kind of a quick hacky test. So let's test it out. We'll plug in the USB to the Maxi, the 9-pin to the real C64, and then plug in our joystick to the other end. Okay, so I've got the joystick test program loaded on both computers. The moment of truth. Let's start with up. <laughs> that actually works. Look at that. And you can instantly see the latency on the C64 Maxi. Look. So I'm actually filming this at 60 frames per second. So if we count how many frames behind the Maxi is, we can easily calculate the latency. And probably the easiest way to calculate the frames per second is in my editing software. You can see here the timeline of that clip. And up here, obviously you can watch when the word up appears on each screen. So if I move forward just one frame at a time, bear in mind there are 60 frames in a second. So there, that's the moment that the Commodore 64 registers the up. So now let's count. We're gonna go forward one frame at a time. One, two, three, four, four frames. And it takes a little moment for the screen to light up. Four frames, that is four sixtieths of a second which in milliseconds equals 66.7 milliseconds. But what about the actual USB adapter? That uses the USB 2 protocol, which adds a latency of about 0.02 milliseconds. Not even worth factoring in, because we're gonna round our final figure to one decimal place. However, I'm also using this portable monitor by Ozai. They kindly donated it for this test. It has a very good latency, very low latency, about 16 milliseconds. But we should therefore subtract that from the 66.7. And we don't have to worry about the Sony CRT screen because CRTs have no discernible latency at all. All of which tells us that the C64 Maxi has an actual latency of 50.7 milliseconds. That is not bad at all. And it gives us some great info for our Zap64 review. But remember the 9-bit guys test? His delay was calculated at 0.09 seconds or 90 milliseconds. So why was his higher? Well, we chatted about this and he said there's probably two reasons. He was filming at 30 frames per second, so he'd get a slightly less accurate result. And also my Maxi might have newer firmware, making it less infirm. And then of course you add on to that the delay caused by his monitor. Well, either way, there's really nothing to complain about. That latency is very small. So they've done a great job. But how about me? All right, let's try right. Down, left, fire. Wait. <laughs> uh, so left. Wait, everything's working perfectly on the real C64. Up, down, left, right, fire. But on the maxi, <laughs> left is fire, and fire is left. I think this is probably my color blindness coming into play here. Uh, let's call in some reinforcements. So the reason I've called you here is, can you let me know if I've wired any colors in a mismatched fashion? You have wired colors in a mismatched fashion. Oh, I thought, I thought so. Is it bad or how many? Um, it's just two. You mix the green with the gray. This is gray and you've crossed it with a green. And this Wait, one- Wait, that's gray? This is gray and this is green. <laughs> that looks like light gray and dark gray to me. Nope. And in the other light, they looked like the other way around. One was, the dark one looked light and the light looked dark. Color blindness is weird. You look so pretty today though. Thank you. I love your green eyes. You're blue, like yours. I love your blue eyes. I have blue eyes. <laughs> Someone once told me I had pink eye. <laughs> By the way, I was thinking of calling this video Two computers, one joystick. What do you think? I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> I am just amazed this works though. Look, we are playing two computers with one joystick. Well, whatever I end up calling this video, we better fix that cable. 
and the first thing I've done is cut off that white 5 volts cable you probably saw hanging loose there. That 5 volts only gets sent from the computer for use with analog joysticks or paddles that have a potentiometer, so we don't need that. Now before we test it again, I should point out I could have used some diodes to prevent the two computers stepping on each other, or some resistors in the unlikely event that any damage would be caused, but I had a hunch none of that would be necessary, and as Steve Jobs would say, it would just work. If we'd used these from the start, we would never have known, but you can always implement these if you do a similar build. So with those wrong wires switched around, let's try and load the joystick tester program again. Well, now the C64 Max is not working at all. <sighs> so much for it just works. I wonder if it's because I plugged the joystick in before I powered the Maxi on. Here we go again. I'm actually nervous. <sighs> Wait, up. Up. Down. Down. Right. Right. Left. Left. Fire. Fire. Yes. My gosh, my ridiculous hacky contraption works 100%. Wow. Now as you can see in this clip, I did originally put some big heat shrink tubing over the whole cable before soldering, but unfortunately it was just too small for the finished build, so I'm going to have to defer to using electrical tape instead. There you go. Who said this was hacky? <laughs> yeah, I did. Phew, that's a bit better. Pretend we're playing Daily Thompson's Decathlon. Pretend we're playing Spy vs. Spy. Pretend we're playing Star Wars. Great. Okay. Next stop, test some games. Well, this video is getting quite long and I'd really like to devote a whole recipe to that playtesting because it's not just the maxi that we can compare using our cable. If we pull the USB off, well, how about Commodore 64 versus Amiga? Yeah, we could actually see how the same ported games compare across two systems. In fact, we could compare converted games on any system that uses 9-pin or USB ports. Atari Star Wars in C64 versus Atari 400, anyone? We'll start that fun in part two next week. So for now, thanks for watching, subscribe below, and cheerio. Mm -hmm.